So good evening. I just want to welcome you, those of you who this is your first time to the Literature Lounge. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And for those of you who have been here before, we thank you in advance for coming in the Lit Lounge again. Tonight, we have the one and only Dr. Meyer Cummings and Dr. Tracy Alexander with We're Better Than This. Tracy, take it away. Clarissa, thank you so very much. And thank you everyone for your patience. We hope that Dr. Ruth Simmons will be joining us. Just a little technical difficulty, but that will not stop us because we've got 40 days and we've got work to do. And with 40 days to the election, we know we're going to sit, stand, walk, run whatever we need to do to make sure we get the message out. And it's just so befitting and it's just so, um, it's so wonderful to have Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, my soror with us today. And I say that because all that is happening today with 45 and the information that is coming out and the announcements. And so to have you today to discuss chairman's life work after spending 23 years serving us in Congress and then writing this book, letting us know we are better than this, my fight for the future of democracy. Sora, Maya, my first question to you is what would chairman say today after hearing some of the announcements from Obamacare to not willing to leave the White House if he should lose the election and so many things. What would Chairman say to us today? So Aurora, Tracy, let me just say that uh, I'm pleased to be on with you. Thanks to your entire team, to Clarissa uh, for having me on your platform. You've already said what he would say. It, we're better than this. Uh, Elijah uh, had intimate uh, engagement with the Trump White House. He saw every investigation of note uh, that came uh, out of the White House over the last few years, everything from Trump's taxes uh, to what happened at the southern border with the children being separated to the families, uh, to the U.S. Census question that they tried to ram through even though it was racist. Uh, and he, he went toe to toe with him on health care. Uh, and so he knew that the Trump administration was trying to uh, destroy the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he, would not, he was not, of course, surprised when the Trump administration petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to invalidate the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so he would not have been surprised today with the paltry, wimpy uh, health care plan that the president, uh, number 45, uh, released today as a quote-unquote replacement for the Affordable Care Act. And Elijah mm -hmm. always said, and he's speaking to the American people and to your audience from the grave through this book, that if Trump gets a second term, we will have no democracy. He knew mm -hmm. that Donald Trump was going to try to undermine our democracy and we're already seeing it. Indeed, in fact, in the book, he talks about his first meeting in 2017 with 45. And he clearly talks about how he went, and we all know, we all know Congressman's work, how he worked across the lines. He worked with everyone religiously, without question. And he talked about that first meeting when he sat down and explained decreasing the price of prescription drugs and all of the things that he wanted to share with 45. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when we went to the uh, inauguration, uh, we went to the luncheon afterwards and Elijah used the occasion of first meeting uh, Donald Trump uh, to basically hit him up for a meeting on prescription, lowering prescription drug costs for the American people. Elijah was deeply familiar with the uh, skyrocketing prices of prescription drugs. He felt that people were dying and he knew that people were dying because they couldn't afford them. And he felt like this was a bipartisan issue that he and Donald Trump and others could work on in order to help the American people. And he earnestly approached him about having a meeting. Trump, to his credit, set up the meeting. Uh, and so he went into the meeting. He, Elijah felt like they had an earnest conversation. Uh, it was heartfelt uh, for Elijah. 
Uh, and he left the meeting thinking initially that it was a great meeting, uh, relatively speaking. And within minutes, he found out that Trump came out of the meeting lying about and twisting his words about what he said. Uh, and he never heard from Donald Trump again regarding lowering prescription drug costs. And so that was just one of the, uh, the uh, moments that gave him the measure of the man. Uh, he, has, uh, he determined that not only was Mr. Trump uh, not uh, capable of helping and serving the American people, but he also... Um, he also felt as if, uh, you know, this man was a danger uh, to our democracy, but also a danger to humanity at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I, um, I just want to touch upon on page 155, when he is, uh, when, when the congressman is on uh, this week with George Stephanopoulos, and he talks about him a question, and he says, do you think Donald Trump is a racist? And such a very candid question, right? Just a candid question. And when I read this, I thought, because it gave me pause the way Congressman answered the question. And he was honest. He was honest. And I, I mentioned this because he talks about the lies, the lessons, and everything he has been trying to teach us right. since 45 walked in the White House. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember that moment on the oh, show? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, basically, Stephanopoulos asked Elijah if Donald Trump was a racist, and Elijah said yes. Uh, and so, you know, the fact of the matter is that we have a man who has somehow assumed the presidency of the United States of America. He has harbored white supremacists in the White House. He had them on his campaign team in 2016. He has talked about people who have rammed down uh, protesters uh, with their cars as good people on both sides. White nationalists who have been protesting uh, you know, and so with that, you know, Elijah knew that what we were dealing with is a very dangerous man, someone who not just traffics uh, in, uh, in language uh, that is racist, uh, but also uh, advances racist policies. Uh, so I mentioned earlier the U.S. Census question, which went before the Supreme Court, uh, and we found out through a series of events uh, that the White House actually knew it was a racist policy, and they pushed it anyway. Uh, we found out that um, they had done, the Republicans had done all of the legwork to find out uh, how, what the impact of the question, uh, are you a citizen, would have on the census. And they knew it would depress black and brown turnout and black and brown uh, count, the black and brown count, uh, while actually empowering uh, Republicans and whites. Uh, and so with that, Elijah doggedly pursued them. And Donald Trump, of course, uh, hit back at Elijah because Elijah was so effective. You know, and that, that brings me to, to what's happening today and the conversation as we, um, we see it just unfolding before our very eyes that the president, the leader of the free world, is talking about not leaving the White House if in fact he loses the election. What does that message send to the American people? Elijah knew that Donald Trump was autocratic. What does that mean? He's a dictator. He does not believe in democracy. Uh, and Elijah actually pointed out that uh, Donald Trump has no knowledge of and no empathy or patience for uh, the rules of civics. Uh, and so uh, because of that, um, he's just willing to do whatever, uh, and he thinks that he can do whatever. Uh, so we have seen someone who has had disregard for the Constitution, disregard for democratic norms, uh, disregard for everything. And that is why he firmly believed uh, that if Donald Trump manages to somehow secure another term by hook or by crook, and I say crook with emphasis, uh, then he will never leave the White House voluntarily. That's, that is actually frightening. I, I, I'm sitting here just an ordinary person. Many of us are just watching the news and we're listening to this information. And I, I can't really believe what I'm hearing. I've You've never gotta heard. You've got to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
But you've never heard a president of the United States say on international news media that mm -hmm. he will not, he will likely, uh, you know, not comply with any election results that he doesn't like. And that is unheard of. But that is the man that we are dealing with. Elijah considered him amoral. Uh, he also um, believed uh, that, uh, that the president had a cruelty streak uh, that was dangerous for humanity. Uh, and he also believed, of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that the president's, uh, you know, the, the, that number 45 uh, is anti-democratic. In fact, an enemy to our democracy. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, as we know, she wrote the foreword uh, in this book, and it is very telling, it's very detailed, and she speaks about her friend, um, your husband, Congressman Elijah Cummings, and she calls him our North Star. She calls him our North Star, and I want you to speak to him being the North Star for so many people. What does that mean for you? So Elijah had this uncanny ability to rally people. Uh, when he spoke, it was like the voice of God coming through. Uh, he had gravitas uh, and his voice just carried so much weight for a lot of people. Uh, and, and he would always, um, you know, he always said that he didn't want to just achieve common ground. He wanted to achieve higher ground. And he often challenged his colleagues uh, to, and he always said, it's bigger than us. Let's think about the big picture. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we need to do together to get to the big picture and to advance our largest goals uh, and values? And so with that, you know, Nancy Pelosi was a good friend of his. Uh, she's a daughter of Baltimore, even though she moved out to San Francisco, got married to a man from San Francisco and stayed. Uh, she maintained her connections in Baltimore. She and Elijah were not only friends, Elijah considered her a mentor. She was very supportive of Elijah and he considered her a master strategist. Uh, and so with that, you know, we were very pleased when she agreed to actually write the forward of the book. Uh, she uh, is simply terrific. And of course, she led the effort uh, to ensure that Elijah lie in state, the being coming the first ever African-American uh, congressman to ever lie in state in the U.S. Capitol, and also to be the first ever African-American congressman, African-American period of any uh, background, uh, to actually have a room in the U.S. Capitol named after him. You know, and I just want to, uh, before we, you know, continue to talk about the relationship of um, that, uh, Congressman and um, the speaker had. I just want to pull it back a little bit to his beginnings because we, we talk so much about what his vision was and what he saw happening um, unfold before his eyes and warning us about 45. But let's just set up the man that um, some people may not know the beginning, the early days, the formative years, you know, when the congressman talked about being uh, the kid in the in the special ed class, we would know it as a, a child having an IEP, but he spoke honestly about that. And let's bring it full circle that, you know, the kid with that IEP was Phi Beta Kappa from Howard University. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Let me just take it a little bit further back, though. His parents escaped from South Carolina, where they felt like they had no future working as the children of sharecroppers and just seeing a bleak future for themselves as sharecroppers. So some people that they knew had moved north to Baltimore and they followed uh, that path. Uh, so they raised a young family in South Baltimore, segregated South Baltimore that was still in the pre-civil rights segregated Jim Crow South. Uh, and so Elijah's early years were lived in separate and unequal schools. Uh, with, you know, of course, him being unable to go into, uh, you know, public uh, institutions that were uh, serving whites, etc. cetera. Uh, and so, you know, that set up, uh, uh, you know, a, an early part of his life that was deeply damaging, I think, to his self-esteem. And that was actually complicated by the fact that he was placed in, into the third group, which was considered the special ed uh, group uh, when he was a young person. Uh, he always said that they said that he talked too much, uh, and so they placed him in special ed. Uh, and so, you know, he always felt like he was less than because of it. Um, it, it hurt his self-esteem, his perception of what he could do. Uh, but one day, uh, as he was approaching, I think it was fifth grade, 
uh, he went up to his teacher and he said, I don't think I'm supposed to be uh, in special ed. I don't think I'm supposed to be in the third group. Uh, I think that I can do more and be more. Uh, and the teacher listened uh, and he gave Elijah extra assignments. Elijah was diligent. He would go to after school. He would go to uh, the library and study on his own. He got help from the librarians. Uh, and he eventually caught up and tested into um, the first class, which was considered, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the advanced class. And so with that, uh, shortly thereafter, Elijah went on uh, to, um, you know, attend uh, City uh, College in Baltimore, uh, which is a high school, but it's a, it was a very uh, prestigious high school. He graduated with honors there. He went to Howard University, graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He went to the University of Maryland Law School, passed the bar on the first time. Uh, and so it just goes to show you with many young African-Americans, especially black males uh, that are labeled special education in life. And by the way, my brother, who is brilliant and serves on the city council uh, in San Marcos, Texas, uh, and is an author and a teacher, uh, he was also labeled special education. So uh, a lot of these diagnoses are actually misdiagnoses uh, and they're intended to actually derail the entire life course of our young people. And so we simply have to be able to challenge it. Elijah always stood for making sure that people weren't falsely and mislabeled uh, so that, uh, that they could be all that they were meant to be. Perhaps that was the reason why he would say, bring me the new members, bring me the new members because he wanted to train them because it's like he never forgot. He never forgot from whence he came. So let me give you a skinny on that. Um, you know, we knew uh, that the squad was coming because, you know, they had taken down some established members of Congress. Uh, they were already making waves. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez especially uh, was savvy. She was a communication savant. Uh, mm -hmm. She actually um, was actually being heard on a national level before she ever took con uh, the, her seat in Congress. Uh, and so a lot of members didn't want them. They didn't want members of the squad on their committee. And Elijah went to Nancy Pelosi and he's just like, give them, give them to me, give them to me. Uh, because I need their energy. I want their intellect. I think uh, that they will be good for my committee and they will be good uh, for the issues that uh, we're going to be facing. Uh, and so Elijah was never afraid of strong women, uh, women who were intelligent, uh, who had, you know, an opinion. Uh, and he embraced them. He mentored them. If you ask Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or, um, you know, any of them, uh, they will tell you uh, that he was very supportive of them. And so, you know, with that, you know, I was proud of him when he did it. Uh, and we had conversations about it at home, uh, but I think that it paid off for him because they actually did help to advance the work of the committee. And, and we talk about strong women, let's talk about you, because um, that strong woman that stood by his side, you, Maya, and the baton has been passed to you. And you've got to champion his cause. You've got to be the one out here in these streets, right? And so what does that mean to you? It means the world to me. I loved Elijah to life. He always said, don't say to death, uh, to life. Mm. I loved him to life. He was just an incredible human being. He was an empath, meaning that he felt deeply. I've never met a man who could listen so keenly. I mean, he listened so closely uh, that, you know, he would remember what I said before what I said, before I remember what I said. Uh, and so, you know, he was just a beautiful spirit, um, you know, and I just feel just blessed. I feel blessed that God allowed our paths to cross and that um, we were allowed to walk this journey for so many years. Um, that being said, you know, he almost a year ago now, he mm -hmm. passed away. Uh, and so with that, you know, I tell people and they say, I'm sorry for your loss, but the reality is it's our loss. Um, and, you know, it's just not my baton to carry, it's our baton to carry. It's Indeed. our it Indeed. is, this is our, Elijah used to say, this is my watch. We got to do everything that we, I got to do everything that I can, but this is our watch. We have to do everything we can to ensure that our um, country is safe so that our children's futures are safe and our families are safe. 
And so we have got work to do. Indeed, indeed. I'm glad you said that we have work to do. And I just want to um, read a quote. Uh, the, the year that he passed, right before then he says, we're dancing with the angels. The question will be asked. In 2019, what did we do to make Make sure we kept our democracy in. What did we do? So when you're out here and you're championing the cause and you are fighting for the future of our democracy each and every day, we see you out here. We know your work. What do we need to do as a nation first to ensure? Because it's very clear, as you so eloquently stated, our democracy is at stake and we should bring the alarm. So what do we need to do? So you said earlier, you know, you were, it's, you, you were afraid that this is scary and it is absolutely scary, but it's very real. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to act with a sense of urgency, voting, 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 mobilize your networks. It is so incredibly important. If your clubs, if your sororities and fraternities, if your churches, if your, you know, if your communities are not talking about voting, get the people and get the leadership of those organizations on board. Because what's at stake in 40 days can affect the history of this country. It can affect, uh, dramatically impact your lives. Elijah believed sincerely that if this man gets another term, uh, we're looking at mass human suffering. We've already seen it. He didn't even know that the coronavirus was coming. But we've already seen what their incompetence and their malfeasance has done in terms of imperiling our lives. That's only going to get worse. Mind you, uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the biggest pledges that Donald Trump has indicated that he's planning to do if he gets a second term is dismantle Social Security. Can you imagine the, his, the human suffering that'll take care, uh, that'll take place if you know, our seniors aren't getting, uh, you know, the, uh, the income that they need. Uh, if dependent children aren't getting the income that they need or dis disabled individuals aren't getting the income that they need. We have work to do and everybody, no one should feel complacent. And I especially want you, if you live in a red state or if you know people who live in a red state, I want you to call them, email them, text them, tell them to turn out the vote in their communities because we need this man not to be able to claim that he won the electoral college and the only way that he can do that is by uh, running up his numbers in the red states we need to actually over index in these states so that he has no chance of ever claiming a victory call to action you have definitely given us the call to action and how to mobilize and what to do and we're going to keep talking about this over and over again we're going to keep talking about what are the steps we need to do we've got 40 days but let's be honest 40 days to get to november 3rd and then what's going to happen thereafter What's going to happen thereafter? We spent a lot of time on 45 and, 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 and the reason, let me, let me just pull it back. I do want to talk about the Affordable Care Act one more time. I want to bring that up because you speak to the sacrifices, the consequences that will happen amongst so many Americans, so many Americans if some of these, some of these institutions are dismantled. So uh, you should know and your audience should know that I, uh, I used to run a Washington DC based think tank. Uh, and so we were not just involved in the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we did studies about it after it was implemented. Uh, and we found out that the Affordable Care Act managed to close racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare coverage in this country. Uh, and the numbers of uninsured uh, people went down across the board. Every racial and ethnic group, every gender, uh, everybody experienced a decline in the number of uninsured, which is a great thing. Uh, and the, the, the uninsured rate between black and white children actually disappeared. Uh, the number of insured African-Americans increased. Uh, and, uh, and so... And it did so not because of the expansion of Medicaid, because the expansion of Medicaid, incredibly enough, helped white people more than it helped black people, because they actually, the states that uh, have a disproportionate share of African-Americans, 
uh, did not expand Medicaid. Uh, but that being said, you know, the Trump administration, as soon as they came in, they went after the aspects of the Affordable Care Act uh, that actually helped people of color the most. Uh, they sought to dismantle it piece by piece. Uh, and then now, of course, they've got this uh, piece of uh, this uh, uh, challenge in the courts now before the Supreme Court to dismantle the entire thing. And so, you know, Elijah knew that they were a threat to our health and a threat to our wealth, and the Affordable Care Act is a perfect example. Uh, these people mean us no good. They mean the American people no good. Uh, and so with that, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. Indeed, indeed. I just want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about the relationship that Congressman had with President Barack Obama. Yes. Yes. So Elijah, so, okay, let's see, where shall I start? He, it's a um, lot. I know it's a lot to unpack with that relationship, but I think it's really early, important. He was a very early support, even though he was good friends with President Clinton and Hillary Clinton. Indeed, indeed. He was a very early supporter of Barack Obama. He was very excited about the potential for an Obama presidency. Uh, and before we even, before Obama even announced, uh, we had received word through the grapevine that he was considering running. And we sent word back through the grapevine uh, that, uh, that we would support him. Uh, and we encouraged him. Uh, and so with that, you know, Elijah was a uh, co-chair of the Obama campaign here in the state of Maryland. Uh, he worked hard, we worked hard uh, on behalf of President Obama. Uh, and he was proud uh, when President Obama took office uh, in January of 2009. We were invited to the uh, post-inauguration uh, White House celebration. It was at midnight. Uh, which was a very special uh, occasion uh, that we, will, we would never forget. Uh, and we were also invited to, of course, a number of state dinners. And uh, we went to the first ever White House uh, Super Bowl party. And so Elijah enjoyed a real relationship with President Obama. Uh, and President Obama, of course, honored Elijah's memory by showing up and giving a eulogy at his funeral. And so we deeply appreciate he and Michelle uh, and uh, certainly, um, you know, wish we had someone of their integrity uh, in, uh, in the White House now. And, and that's a great transition to Vice President Joe Biden, Senator Kamala Harris. Clearly, clearly they need our support. I mean, we can't, we can't say that enough. Clearly we, you know, let's be very clear. And as I tell everyone, let's be very clear. I use my platform, I have a platform, we have a platform and we have work to do. And that being said, that being said, what would Congressman say to Senator Kamala Harris now that she is the VP choice? So, so first to... I should say that he would be very proud of her. Uh, he was proud of her intelligence, her hard work, her fighting spirit. Uh, their fellow Howard University Bisons. Uh, and so, Indeed. you know, he um, would have been proud from a Howard grad perspective, but also just from, uh, a, you know, a man supporting a woman, a black man supporting a black woman. I mean, incredibly proud. Uh, and of course, supportive. Uh, and so he would have endorsed the Biden-Harris ticket uh, and stood firmly uh, in support of their election. Uh, and, incur and he would encourage every one of you out there who are listening to vote for Biden Harris because that is the you know the best opportunity we have uh, to rebuild our democracy to recover from the unfortunate crisis of the last four years uh, and to build towards a future that's diverse and inclusive. Indeed, indeed, and 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 that is so important for us to rally behind Biden Harris ticket and put our money put our time and put our energy to make sure that we do not leave not one stone unturned. And I just have a question that uh, just came in and let me read this to you. What do you think is the best way to vote at this time? Is it early voting at the poll or to mail it in, mail your ballot in, mail it in? So please note that everybody has different rules. Every state has different mm -hmm. rules. If your state Indeed. has early voting, 
and you feel comfortable going into a poll, I want you to suit up, put on a mask, put on glasses. Everybody forgets glasses. Uh, and if you want, put on some gloves and go in and cast your vote, your ballot early. Um, if I don't trust, um, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, what's happening with the U.S. Postal Service right now, uh, given uh, what Donald Trump has done in terms of putting his loyalist in as the head of the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, and so, you know, the question becomes one of, you know, do you just put a stamp on it and send it in? Um, I, I'm not personally going to do that. Um, what I plan to do is they are going to send me the ballot that I requested, and then I'm going to walk it up to the, uh, the, the State Board of Elections, and they have a number of drop boxes around the city uh, and certainly around this area. So I'm just going to walk it up and drop it off personally instead of send it through the mail. Indeed. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I, you know, it's, um, I think we got to organize and we have to strategize to help those who cannot get to the polls. Um, I think that's really important as well. And I know a lot of organizations are really working together to make sure whether it's getting, you know, a bus, giving a ride, whatever it takes, a lot of our churches, a lot of our faith-based communities. And I just want to applaud all the work right now that's being done. I do. I want to just give Everyone, a round of applause for all of the energy, the late hours, the phone calls that are happening right now to make sure November 3rd comes to fruition and then thereafter, because that's when the work is really going to start. I want to, I want to ask you this question. What do you think, knowing your experience from the political arena, being um, a Balt, being a resident in Baltimore, traveling the nation and talking and listening to people, being the wife of Elijah Cummings, what does Vice President Biden need to do to ensure that he gets the vote? I think that he needs to listen. I think that what we're seeing right here with regards to, you know, the protests that are taking place with regards to police brutality, uh, certainly the needs that we have that are economic and the health care issues that we're having related to coronavirus. Uh, he needs to uh, listen uh, and he needs to make sure that his policy agenda speaks directly to our issues. Um, it's not about getting into office and then turning your back on the people who brought you to the dance. It's about getting into office and acknowledging your gratitude uh, for the people who brought you to the dance by making sure that issues that are affecting them are directly addressed uh, in a manner that is the most effective and efficient way uh, to bring relief. Uh, and so, um, you know, you said it earlier, um, you know, the work really begins after, elect after the election. Then it's about holding uh, the new administration prayerfully accountable and making sure that they advance policies and pass policies that are supportive of humanity, that are supportive of uh, progressive issues that face our country, uh, our country and certainly our community. Any words, any pearls of wisdom? And I know you've already, you know, you've been in contact with, um, with um, Senator Harris's team, but while we have you here, what would you say to her or what have you said? to ensure so first of all, that could, she gets to vote. Mm -hmm. So she's already been organizing. Um, her team has been very smart to uh, leverage and organize Black Women's Collective. I think right after our call tonight, Oprah is going to be on with a lot of Black women leaders uh, talking yes, about indeed. what we must do uh, yes, in this election cycle. Uh, and so, and this is all for, and she's got, you know, literally we are, we have her back. Um, she's been out doing her thing. And of course, uh, Donald J. Trump has been trying to undermine her by saying things. And we have, uh, you know, a whole communications operation where we're monitoring what's being said. And then we push back, um, uh, you know, through the media. And we also push back through social media. Uh, and so with that, you know, Senator Harris has basically the wind at her back and the support mm -hmm. of her sisters, which is um, something that's incredible indeed when you can get it. 
Uh, and so with that, you know, I think that she's positioned herself well. She's going out and she's talking uh, to groups across the country. Uh, and so to ensure the vote uh, is to make sure that the resources are deployed correctly uh, to Indeed. support turnout, uh, is to make sure that the, the Democratic National Committee is doing what it needs to do uh, to reach all the communities that need to be mobilized. Uh, and it needs to meet, it means also to make sure that she actually can hold her uh, presidential uh, companion to account when it comes to taking office. And before we go, I think it's really important to speak to our youth, to speak to our young, our youngins, as 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 um as our Sora called them uh, yesterday, our youngins, right? And I, I say that with love, and I say that with true endearment, um, because our young people, uh, it's really about them. Our fight is really to make sure that they have all of the civil rights that are due to them, that have, that many of our people have died for to make sure that you and I and our children have our civil rights. And I say that because I often hear that some of our young people are really disengaged not that they're they're not disengaged of the process. Let me let me be clear. They're very they're very alert and very aware of what's going on, and they can articulate what's happening very well. They've taken to the streets. They're protesting. But what I mean is, they see what's going on, and they see the injustices. They see the injustices. I mean, my goodness, we can spend the next hour talking about the injustice around Breonna Taylor. But the question I have for you is speak to them, to encourage them, to motivate them, to look beyond the injustices. What pearls of wisdom can you give our young people? So I want the young people of America to know that um, you're right not to look beyond the injustices uh, because what they show are um, stark disparities, but also double standards in our system of laws uh, and the treatment that we receive in this country, which is uh, directly against uh, certainly um, everything that our constitution is supposed to stand for, uh, and certainly what the civil rights movement fought for. And so we need your energy. We need your push. We need your bravado. We need your leadership. Uh, to actually keep the wind under this new civil rights movement, to push for a more, more perfect union. Now, a lot of us uh, and a lot of you uh, seem to think that, uh, that your voice doesn't matter when it comes to voting or voting doesn't matter. It's all rigged anyway. Uh, the fact of the matter is that they're trying hard to rig it because they know that you have power but they want to convince you you don't have power. And the second that you comply with what they want you to think, you have surrendered. And you surrender. haven't given, you, you have not given it your all. You have not done what you must do to carry the baton forward, to actually make sure we have an empowered and whole community. And so I am just encouraged the young people to understand that it's an inside outside game. Yes, go out in the streets and protest peacefully, Absolutely. but also go to the ballot box, cast your ballot, go to the mayor's office, go to the governor's office, go, you got to engage. Civic engagement, continuous civic engagement is the price that we have to pay for freedom in this country. Indeed, indeed. And I just want to end on a quote from Congressman in his, um, I think it's on page 11, when he talks about my pain fuels my passion. My passion drives my purpose. That just spoke to me. And if you could just end on that note, what that means to you as you carry the baton for us and with us. So, you know, fortunately, you know, Elijah and I shared uh, a same passion uh, for making sure that government works for all, for making sure that we have a diverse and inclusive nation. Elijah came up with that formula, pain, passion, poor purpose, uh, because, you know, a lot of people feel lost. They don't necessarily know what their purpose is in life. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to give particularly young people a formula for understanding how to point yourself towards 
your purpose or your North star in life. Uh, and so he usually, he felt like it usually from your deepest pain, something that you've observed or experienced uh, comes your desire to make sure that nobody else has to go through it. Uh, so that fuels a passion for you. And then it leads you to your life's work, your purpose on this earth. Uh, and so with that, it did for him. The pain of growing up in the Jim Crow South uh, led him to his passion to make sure that nobody else has to experience the indignities of being considered undeserving, uh, even though they're citizens of this country. Uh, led him to a career uh, in law and then politics, and then led him to one of the highest uh, positions in the U.S. Congress, his purpose. Uh, where he did his incredible best to make a difference on behalf of the underdogs. Uh, and so with that, um, you know, Elijah was a beautiful human being. Uh, he is sorely missed. Uh, and certainly his message to you from the grave is that we're better than this. We can do better and we can be better. We are better than this. We are all better than this. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maya. Rocky Moore Cummings. Thank you so much for carrying the baton. Thank you for seeing this book come to fruition. Thank you so much for being a champion. And we've got 40 days and we're going to fight and we're going to keep on working together. I'm so excited for all of the organizations that we are all a part of and watching us all unite, get together every night. And of course, after you tune in, with us in the Literature Lounge, please check out Oprah Winfrey with all of the African-American female leaders out there talking about making sure you vote. Doc Masoma, thank you so very much. And I'm sure we're going to end on Just Stand. Is that the music that's coming? Let's enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. Oh, you just stand You just stand and watch the Lord's You just stand You just stand Yes, I'm you know, all